Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your favorite quarterback hater, Robert Mathis, and you're listening to the For the Culture Podcast. This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. 34-17 Colts over the Tennessee Titans in Nashville. A huge game for both teams, but the biggest game of the year for the Indianapolis Colts going on the road to Nashville, taking on the Titans, short week, Thursday night football, fighting all the adversity coming off a tough loss against the Baltimore Ravens, a game back of the Titans in the AFC South, and 0-1 in the division after losing to Jacksonville in Week 1. The Titans came into this game 2-0 in the AFC South, beating the Jags on a field goal and then beating the Texans in overtime. So we came in at 5-3. and three. They came in at 6-2, and two, and they were 2-0 in the AFC South. We were 0-1 in the AFC South. So if we lost this game, we would have fallen to 5-4. and four. They would have improved to 7-2. and two. We would have been two games back, plus we would have lost the first head-to-head. We would have been 0-2 in the division. They would have been 3-0 and in the division. So I just can't state it enough how big this game was for the Indianapolis Colts. This was the biggest game of the season and quite frankly the biggest regular season game the Colts have had since at Tennessee week 17 of 2018 which was essentially a playoff game and a play-in game for the wild card in 2018. We go on the road and we beat the Tennessee Titans, like we do today, 34-17, offense, defense, special teams. We needed all three phases of the game. We got all three phases of the game. Defense pitching a shutout in the second half. Offense putting up 34 points, or I should say putting up 27 points plus another 7 points from special teams. EJ Speed, friend of the show, came on the For the Culture podcast last year, getting the block punt, scoop and score by TJ Carey. The offense finding a way to put up points, finding a way to move the ball, finding a way to stay in a rhythm, and a great job by Frank Reich. We got off to a slow start. So we already have the adversity of Thursday night football, of going on the road, playing a road game on a short week in Nashville. They come out the gate, they get ball first, 7-0, 17-10, 24 unanswered points for the Indianapolis Colts. Phillip Rivers, 300 yards, Michael Pittman Jr. are coming out party, his first 100-yard game, Naheem Hines over 110 yards of total offense from the line of scrimmage and a pair of touchdowns on his birthday, happy birthday, Naheem Hines, and he gets a birthday present of probably one of our players of the game, we'll get into that later on, and a big Colts W on the road against the Tennessee Titans. So all three phases of the game, offense, defense, special teams, the Colts were fantastic today. We outcoached the Titans in this game. We outplayed the Titans, and we stepped on their necks. We played 60 minutes. We got off to that slow start, but that's when the adversity kicks in, and this team did not shy away. 34-17, a big-time win, a statement win, and a big win in the standings for the Indianapolis Colts. Yeah, Luke, and I got to say this, man, as a Colts fan and just as somebody that loves this team, I I have to tell you, man, I I am so proud of these players and the staff. With the way the schedule was set up, very easy to go in the tank, like, you know, for whatever reason, especially with the way the game started. Mm -hmm. But this team is a team of leaders, and there's a lot of intestinal fortitude on the coaching staff and within that locker room. And I am, I'm just so proud of the way a, they came back after a loss B they bounced back after a slow start in the game and C the biggest thing I loved about the way this game went is it it was a team win offense, defense, special teams. And at the end of the day, when the chips were down, they put their foot on the, on the Titans neck at the end of this game, they could have very easily let them back in the game. They did the exact opposite. They buried them. They really dominated this game, in my opinion, from beginning to end. From If you look at the play sheet and the amount of plays run and the time of possession, the Colts just wore them down, wore them out. And I'm so friggin' proud of these players, the coaches, coming back on a short week on the road against a good team. I don't want – and another thing, I don't want to hear anything about not beating good teams. We went on the road, short week. This team's 5-2 and two on their home field with the best running back in the game, in my opinion. And we came in there, and we we held it down. We got the win, biggest win of the season. 
biggest game of the season because if we don't win this game, Luke, we have no shot at this division. It's over. We're chasing wild card after that. Instead, we come out, we play our best game. Defense shuts them down in the second half. EJ Speed, friend of Ford the Culture, as you guys might know, comes through with a huge block punt, had some pressure on an earlier punt that led to a shank. I mean, just an outstanding win, blanket ship perfect. Just, man, if you couldn't tell, I'm friggin' pumped. I can't wait for what's going to happen for the rest of this season. But tonight, I'm going to sleep like a baby because this was a huge, huge win for the Indianapolis Colts. Couldn't have said it better myself, Jason. This was a big time win for the Colts. We got it done in all three phases. I thought, again, the officiating favored the opponent. And I hate to be that guy that bitches about the officiating. But Cleveland, Baltimore, Tennessee, it seems like this has happened to the Colts time and time again. And when I'm a neutral fan and I'm watching a game between two teams, I have no rooting interest, no money on the game, no nothing. I don't have a dog in the fight. I watch these games and I see bad call after bad call. I thought thought there was like 30 bad calls against the Giants in that Giants-Bucks game on Monday night a few weeks back. So NFL officiating is bad, but I just feel like we've continued to come out on the wrong end of all these close calls, 50-50 calls, weak calls, soft calls, week after week after week. And in the first half of this game, I thought the officiating was against us. I thought that Wright got off to a bad start offensively. We had more yards than them. We were moving the ball. I thought we just looked so much better than the Titans in the first half, and we're trailing on the scoreboard. And it was kind of like last week against Baltimore, except we had a lead at the half, but we dominated. We dominated dominated Baltimore in the first half of that game last week. We have a slight lead at halftime. And then, of course, eventually Baltimore got it going. We lose the game. In this game, we won the first half in terms of outplaying the Titans. I thought we had a better half than them. We were moving the ball up and down the field almost at ease. We were just struggling to get the ball in the end zone. We had a turnover on downs on our first possession, but it really felt like we were the better team in the first half of the game. And you just hope, okay, we're the better team and we're trailing. You hope you don't have another Baltimore situation. And it was obviously the opposite of that. We dominated the second half of this game. The defense pitched a shutout special team scored a touchdown. There was two bad punts. There was a punt blocked and then a shanked punt by Tennessee. They missed the field goal. Blanket ship was perfect. And it's funny, Jason, because if you go back to last year, they blocked a field goal against us, return for a touchdown. And then in this game, we block a punt against them, return for a touchdown. So a little bit of irony there where last year, special teams, and that was a theme for us all year, special teams was a big issue for the Colts. And then in this game, it was a big issue for the Titans and the Colts special teams minus that first kickoff return to start the game for Tennessee. They ran a trick play fake handoff and it got them going, and then their offense got off to the hot start with the touchdown. But it was just a team win, all three phases. I couldn't be happier. And let's start off with the offense, because the offense has obviously taken a lot of criticism this year for the Colts, and rightfully so at times, and we've criticized right time and time again. He got off to a slow start. But when we got on track, I thought there was a couple really good drives. I still thought there were some drives where I wasn't ha- like I wasn't happy with that third and three call to Jordan Wilkins. I didn't understand lining up a guy who's never lined up outside the numbers and targeting him on a third and three. So it wasn't a perfect game offensively, but it was one of the better games this team's played offensively. Rivers was smart. I think he finished. 29 of 39 that included at least one spike in there he was over 300 yards had one passing touchdown no picks no fumbles no turnovers so a smart game from Phillip Rivers he missed Burton for a touchdown he missed Cox for a touchdown so there were opportunities that he did leave out there but in terms of throwing up garbage 50-50 balls he threw one up to Johnson in the end zone that was thankfully not picked off But outside of that, there wasn't any plays. A couple balls maybe tipped at the line of scrimmage, but there was nothing like, oh, my God, you're so stupid. Why would you just throw that football? So he did a good job there. The offensive line got off to a slow start, but then when they got rolling, they were rolling. I have to give an apology to Naheem Hines. We keep saying Rake has to stop 
running him and he was creative with the run so he got him outside where he should be running if you're going to run you got to bounce outside and you got to get him into space but he had 12 carries for 70 yards 5.8 yards per carry and a touchdown and then through the air also extremely effective five receptions 45 yards and a touchdown so it was the third multi-touchdown game for Naheem Hines dominating in this game on prime time. And then Michael Pittman Jr., like we said before, over 100 yards for the first time in his career. So he's starting to come into his own now, which is great. It's great to see different guys get comfortable at different times. We saw a couple weeks ago, Claypool for the Steelers, and then people start to second guess themselves. And Mims look good for the Jets on Monday night, even though he's been banged up this year. And now Pittman had his breakout game where he goes over 100 yards, almost got into the end zone for a touchdown. And I think my favorite part of this game offensively for the Colts, Jason, was we had a turnover on downs inside the one-yard line. You had an almost touchdown, called a touchdown on the field for Zach Paschal. It gets reversed. Good call. Should get reversed. We get held up on the goal line in back-to-back plays, turnover on downs. The defense makes a stop, shank, punt, and then the offense responds with a touchdown drive. And that's huge because this offense this year, and I talked a lot about this in the Baltimore game, they've been derailed so easily. They're moving, they're moving, they're moving, boom, a turnover, the rest of the game sucks. They're moving, they're moving, they're moving, a holding penalty gets backed up, the rest of the game sucks. An interception, a missed field goal, it's the slightest thing that could derail this offense and derail them for the rest of the game. To have a turnover on downs and your second of the game inside the one-yard line after you think you take the lead on the road, that's tough to respond from. Yeah, you get great field position on the shank punt, but that was a play that really, or a drive that really stood out to me because that is battling adversity. That's what I was looking for in that Baltimore game, and we never got it. And we were, it was all downhill after that Jonathan Taylor fumble. In this game, the offense responded to adversity, and that is growth. And you love to see growth. I saw growth from this Colts offense today. Absolutely, and it's, it's a great point, Luke. I mean, you, you come up short on the goal line there. The defense forces a punt. Great job by them. Special teams gets pressure on the punter, which speeds him up. He shanks the punt. The offense gets it, gets the ball, goes down, and scores. That's picking up your teammates. I mean, all the way around. The offense, the defense picked up the offense. The special teams picked up the offense, and then the offense picked up both of them. So I think that's a great point. I think it stands for a bigger point with this team that when adversity hits, they're not going to bow down to it. They're not going to. They're not going to quit. They're going to keep fighting. And no matter what anyone says about this Colts team, they're always going to give you their best effort outside of I think one quarter this season against the Bengals. They're going to give you everything they got. Every side of the ball, special teams included. I thought that was a great turning point in the game and a great point by you to bring that up. As far as I was concerned, the early part of this game was extremely frustrating for me because I felt like going into the game, the strength of the Titans and the really the only strength that they have defensively is their two nose tackles. Like us, they are their two defensive tackles. Like us, they're, they're very good in the middle. I mean, Jeffrey Simmons, I think, is going to be – he's coming on. He's playing really well. He's really good in this game. And Daquan Jones is really good. And those are, their, to me, the two guys in the middle of that defense that you want to run away from. And we just kept running into them. Every running play was into them. It was like Reich was trying to prove a point. And I'm just thinking, you know, their, their middle linebacker is really good. Their two defensive tackles are really good. Let's get away from that. So when he brought in Hines, I was actually happy because we started running more outside. Against the Titans, the only place that you're not going to have success – Running the ball is where we were running it, which was right into the middle of their defense. You want to get wide, they can't stop the pass, they can't stop dump-off passes, and they can't stop wide runs. So once we started getting outside and running more slant runs and getting to the tackle side, the C-gap or whatever, we were hitting gaps and we were getting yardage. It was, it was that A-gap run that was killing us. And once Mike threw that out and said, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to hit the B and the C-gaps, we're going to run through those gaps, we were much, much better in the running game. I thought after he adjusted to that, which has been an issue with us with, that we've had with Reich, his lack of adjustment, his stubbornness, I thought in this game he changed his ways a little bit, started running outside, started using Hines more, started you know getting outside of, of running between the tackles, which is what he loves to do. 
at this point, Luke, I really think we've established that we're not a between-the-tackles team. We can't really run between the tackles with, with the guys we have right now. It's just mm-hmm. we can't do it, especially on short yardage. So you need to be able to adapt. They did that. I thought Phillip Rivers did exactly what I thought he would do. He cooked their defense. They couldn't cover us. Uh, having T.Y. back made a big difference. I know he's not the same player, but having him on the field adds that speed dimension that people have to respect. And I thought our offense played its best game. No turnovers. You know, we had some penalties that we got to clean up, obviously. But I thought they did a great job taking advantage of a porous Titans defense. And when, and, I, and I've said this from day one of watching the NFL. When it comes down to two teams that are playing, generally speaking, the better deep, if the offense are similar, like the Titans have a better offense than we have, but our offense is average. It's not bad. If it comes down to a, a close game or a game that, you know, you really got to win on the road, the better defense more often than, the, than not is going to win. And we're clearly, I don't care what anybody says, we are clearly the best defense in the division, far better than either any of the three teams we play against in this division, and a top five, maybe top three defense in the league, in my opinion. Flus adjusted at halftime. They got nothing in the second half. Great job by our defense, which we'll talk about in a second. But the offense was able to convert. Pittman was outstanding. They got the ball to Hines. You know, they made big catches. Harris had a big catch. Mo Alley had some catches. Uh, And then Hilton had four, four big catches in this game. So playing on a bad groin, he stepped up and played well also. And last but not least, I want to give kudos to our offensive line. I thought they were outstanding giving time for Phillip Rivers to find his receivers. And shout-out to Jacoby Brissett, man. Luke, this is on you, brother. You, you've you been saying, <laughs> why don't we run the quarterback sneak? Well, Jason, this is the thing with those fourth and ones and those third and ones. We've struggled, first of all, all year on short distance. And when you bring Jacoby in, like if you bring him in in any other situation, like this is a situation where the defense knows when he comes in the game exactly what's coming, but that's fine because in a short situation, the defense always knows what's coming and they can't stop it. So it's not like you're telegraphing something that they're going to be able to stop. You could tell them exactly what you're doing and they won't be able to stop those QB keepers. They're so difficult to stop. So, I don't mind bringing him in because I don't care that the defense knows what's coming because they're still not going to be able to stop it. He learned that from Tom Brady, and that is definitely the best part of Jacoby's game. So as long as you're paying him $9 million and he's on the sideline, he's dressed, you might as well bring him in the game because we've turned the ball over on fourth and one too many times this year. You have to convert those. So I'm glad they did that today, and that is a wrinkle I would keep in the offense for the rest of the season. Oh, 100%. And it, I mean, I, and it'll work. I mean, it will work. He's big. It, it, and like you said, it's what he's best at. I mean, it's, I'm not trying to, you know, dog the guy, but I mean, that's, he's literally, I don't know what his percentage is at getting first downs, but he would be much better at getting first downs than giving it to Jonathan Taylor or Naheem Hines or, I mean, it just hasn't worked out. We yeah. haven't been good well, in short yardage. Especially and, because they know Phillip Rivers can't. So when Rivers is in the game, like even with Brissett in the game, you could still hand it off to the running back. You could pitch it out. You could still go off Jacoby, and you could still run okay. other plays yeah. off it, even though they know most right. likely that QB keeper is coming. It adds an element. With Phillip Rivers in there, and you have a running back four or five yards behind him, they know what's coming, and it just takes so much longer to develop. That's why we've been getting stopped in these short situations. With Jacoby in, we don't need to worry about him throwing and doing anything stupid because it's still going to be a run. But at least now, it's is the quarterback going to keep it? Is he going to pitch it? Is he going to hand it off? Like at least there's other options now because everybody's been sniffing out short down situations for the Colts unless we go play action, which also doesn't work because now you have Rivers running backwards, throwing off his back leg, which we did last week, and then yeah. Reich didn't learn from it. He did it again this week, and that's never going to work. Because you're putting Rivers in a situation where he's just not comfortable and you're playing to one of his weaknesses. So the short distance has been awful for the Colts this year. Reich loves Jacoby. We pay Jacoby all this money. We bring him back. You might as well utilize what he's best at. And that's not a disrespectful shot at Jacoby. There's a lot of quarterbacks, Phillip Rivers included, who can't do it. A lot of guys hesitate. A lot of guys aren't strong enough. Tom Brady, who's not a great athlete by any stretch of the imagination in terms of like running and when you look at his combine, and he's not a physical superior athlete, 
but he is incredible at falling forward. He knows how to just get the ball and go. He never hesitates. He finds the perfect gap, and then he uses his big frame. It's not a big athletic frame, but it's a big frame, and he's able to fall forward, push. He always has a running back behind him, push, and he always gets that first down. And Jacoby spent a year and a half behind him. He learned that, and he has that play down pat. So as long as he's dressing and he's your backup quarterback, you might as well use him. I think that's what good teams do. They use everybody on their roster to play to their strength, which is exactly why I got so mad about that third and three play when we have Jordan Wilkins lining up outside the numbers wide and then throwing to him. That's not his game. And I tweeted that out, and people are like, wow, you're blaming Frank Reich for a player dropping a ball? And I'm like, no, I'm blaming Frank Reich for putting a player in a position that plays to a weakness of his. That's a player who's never done that before. It would be like if Eberflus took DeForest Buckner, who's an all-pro defensive tackle, and then put him out wide and had him cover A.J. Brown. That would be a ridiculous decision. Because that's not his bread and butter. That's not his specialty. Jordan Wilkins never lines up outside the numbers. So why don't you use Hines or why don't you use Harris or somebody else in that situation? So Jacoby, you're not going to bring him in and do what you did week one against the Jaguars because that's not playing to a strength. But bringing him in on a fourth and one or a third and one in this case makes all the sense in the world to me. And it paid off and it worked. Absolutely, and just going back to that play, I, I had the same re- with with the with the five wise and Jordan Wilkins out wide. I had the same reaction as you. It, it's not the play call; it's the personnel. And when you have Hines on this roster and Harris on this roster, who who are very, I mean, both those guys legitimately are could play are wide receivers. They can play wide receiver. Mm-hmm. You have two guys like that on your roster, and if you want to get a linebacker on on that fifth guy then use one of them. That was my, my play. My issue was not the play call. My issue was, well, and this is a lot of my issue with Frank. A lot of the times it's not the play calls, it's the personnel groupings. And I just, again, it goes back, Luke, to what we always talk about. He has to put guys in the best position for them to succeed. When was the last time we lined Jordan Wilkins up and had him run an inside slant route? Never. I mean, Exactly. So and that that's and the thing is, that. Jason, I'm not excusing Wilkins dropping the ball. I'm just no, saying no. that you have a good play call. You have a play designed for this situation. A third and three, that play would have worked. You would have been inside the five-yard line. It would have been a first down. It was a good play call. You just did it with the wrong guy. Like I said, like I made that example exactly. on Twitter. DeForest Buckner is a great player. He's a great defensive tackle, but you're not going to have him play cornerback. So a good player is a good player when they do what they are best at. You're not going to have Shaquille O'Neal shooting threes, but Shaquille O'Neal's in the Hall of Fame for a reason because he was great at what he was great at. He was elite on the post. You're not going to have him do something out of his element. So Jordan Wilkins is a good between the tackles running back. He's good out of the backfield, but you're not going to line him out wide. He's never done that before. So why would you start now? Like that's that's out of his wheelhouse. But you have a guy like Hines and you have a guy like Harris. So it's not like we are deprived of players to put in that situation. If we didn't have anybody and Reich's hands were tied, I would give him the benefit of the doubt. And I would say, hey, he designed a great play. Unfortunately, we just don't have the horses to get it done. But we do have the horses to get it done. And in that situation, which at the time was a really big play in the game, he just ran the wrong guy out there. So that's why I was frustrated, and rightfully so. And I had somebody Mark. at the end of the game. We end up putting up 34 points. Obviously, seven came off that pump block. But we end up putting up 34 points, and I had somebody at me and say, are you a fan of Frank Reich now? Listen, I've always been a fan of Frank Reich. Jason, we've been a fan of Frank Reich since the hire. And when we had those three candidates after McDaniels, who we didn't want, and we said we didn't want McDaniels, we didn't like the hire when the Colts made it. And then after McDaniels backed out, there were three candidates. I think it was Campbell from the Dolphins. He was an intern coach there for a little bit. There was one other guy, and then there was Frank Reich. And we wanted Reich. He was the guy we wanted from the jump. I've been a fan of Reich, but just because, and I met him down at the senior, exactly. It doesn't make him free and clear of criticism. I met him down at the senior bowl, first class guy. I have all the respect in the world for Frank Reich as a person, as a coach, as just, I, I have all the respect in the world for Frank Reich, but that doesn't make him immune to criticism. 
I'm still going to criticize and fairly show things that I disagree with, things I don't like. That's our job as podcast hosts. Our job is to give our opinions on something. Doesn't mean I'm always going to be right. I'm going to criticize Reich about things I'm going to end up being wrong about. He obviously knows more football than me. He's an NFL head coach. He played in the league. He's coached in the league for a number of years. Obviously, he's going to know more football than I'll ever know. But it doesn't mean I can't have an opinion. So I'm still going to criticize where I see a fair opportunity to criticize. Nobody is immune to criticism. So I'm a fan of Frank Reich. I've always been a fan of Frank Reich. I've always rooted for Frank Reich. But if he does something I disagree with, I'm going to say it. It doesn't need to be 100% one way, 100% the other way. There's been times in the past where I gave a compliment to Chuck Pagano. It didn't happen very often, but just because I didn't like Pagano as a coach didn't mean that everything he did was always 100% bad. There were some good things in there. He had a great defensive performance on the road in a playoff game against Peyton Manning and the Denver Broncos. I gave him credit for that, even though I wanted him fired one week later after we got our bell rung by New England. But just because you like a guy doesn't mean you have to like everything he does, and just because you dislike a guy doesn't mean you have to dislike everything he does. Completely agree. I, I just There's a couple things I want to talk about offensively before we move on to the defense, and that is, one, I thought Frank Reich did a good job in this game adjusting, which he hasn't done, which, which part of that adjustment was he was going up-tempo and definitely keeping them in the same – keeping the Titans in the same personnel, not, in a lot, not allowing them to sub, which I think allowed us to really take advantage of their sub, suspect secondary – also, I thought Naheem Hines early in this game really saved our butts. Uh, I thought we were kind of struggling early to really get some kind of spark, and I thought he gave it to us and really, uh, I mean, an outstanding job in the first half by him, running the ball, catching the ball, really the entire game. I thought he was the difference in our offense early on, and then and everybody else picked it up as the game went on. And just looking, before we move on, like I just want to hit one more thing. The three keys that we had for this Colts offense going into this game No turnovers, check. Get playmakers the ball in space, check. Play consistent for 60 minutes, foot on gas, check. Oh, 100% check. check. That third one, 100% check, Jason. Absolutely. Our offense did its job tonight, and uh, yes, it started slow, but at the end of the day, they took care of business. They did what needed to be done. And uh, outstanding job by by Reich, by Sirianni, by the coaching staff, and by Phillip Rivers, man. Played a great game. Only had really that one dumb throw. Luckily, the guy was out of bounds. Hines was great. Pittman with his first 100-yard game. I mean, just an outstanding win on the road. First a good division opponent on a short week. Well done, fellas. Huge W. I'm so pumped to see what happens the rest of the season. But, man. Tonight was special, Luke. This was a fun one. Oh, and Luke, one other thing I wanted to mention. You were talking about the refs earlier. It's become abundantly clear to me as a fan and just as a person that knows this league that the NFL as a whole does not respect this team. And I'm not one of these guys that, you know, uh, nobody gives us respect. To me, it's obvious. They always have us on the road on a short week. We always have a jacked-up schedule, okay? We don't get any calls in any game that's a big game. This, they don't respect us. The league does not respect us. Officials seem not to respect us. But guess what? Sometimes a team comes out and just puts their foot to your neck and makes you respect them. And I thought that's what the Colts did tonight. So for all the haters out there that you know thought we didn't beat anybody or we couldn't beat anybody and, and Phillip Rivers was washed, I just want to say one thing. Shh. <laughs> I thought you were going to say a word, and then you shh, which was very appropriate. And to me, it's like there's always going to be bad refs and bad officiating. It just seems like every 50-50 call for the Colts this year, we've come out on the wrong side of. Like last week was disgraceful. The Marcus Peters play, I still can't get over that. In this game, even like in this game, there was a good call against Rock. Rock had a pass interference in the end zone. It was a good call. But on the same play, the receiver grabbed his face mask. That should have been offsetting. So we never got any of those benefit of the doubt 50-50 calls. There was a call against the Nico Autry where they said he was offsides. He never moved. And you were talking about this off air. If he lined up in the neutral zone, that's a different penalty. And they didn't call that. They called offsides. He wasn't offsides. 
So there was a lot of calls like that in this game. I thought the Leonard call and Colt fans were saying that it was a bad play by Leonard and he has to be smarter when he had the late hit out of bounds on Tannehill. To me, it looked like momentum. He barely touched him and Tannehill sold it. And the refs are yeah, always, all, see, the refs are always going to throw that, that flag. They're always going to throw that flag. Like, I've come to terms with that. They throw it cool. all the time. If a quarterback gets hit late, if it, even if it's close, they're going to throw the flag. So, I didn't get too mad about that. But I thought that Colt fans getting on Leonard was wrong. And that's just one of those plays where the refs always call it. And I just always hate it. I just think it's always a bad call. But it's one of those calls that's going to be made every time it happens. Al Qadi Muhammad threw a punch at the end of this game. I don't know what the hell that was about. That's on him, so you have to hold him accountable for that. And I love Al Qadi Muhammad, another friend of the show. I don't know what was going through his head there at the end of the game. You're up by 17 points. He decided to throw a punch at a guy wearing a helmet. So that was one of the yeah, one of the few good Luke, calls. Luke, we were winning the game 34-17 at the time, and you know what I love about what I saw? I saw when he went to the sideline, I saw our D-line coach, Baker, getting in his ass for that. And he mm -hmm. absolutely 100% was right to do it. You can't do stuff like that. I, I love that our coaching staff coaches the entire game and will not put up with any foolishness from our players. And when you hit, do something stupid, get a personal foul, punch a guy in the helmet, really, which is completely pointless, seeing our coaching staff just getting his ass on Wait, the Jason, sideline. Wait, Jason, 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 are you saying that coaches were coaching? <laughs> saying coaches were coaching. Are you saying players? Are you saying players were playing and coaches were coaching? Uh, I am saying that. Yeah. <laughs> and this game, hey, this wasn't this wasn't an August Super Bowl against Buffalo, but this was damn close to a playoff game because of the swing you see in the standings with a loss today. Yeah, like I said, man, we've talked about this off air. They lose this game. The division goes through. I mean, the Tennessee wins the division, in my opinion. We're chasing for yeah, wild card. Opinion. This was such a huge, huge win. And uh, I agree. Colts had to have it. I said it earlier. You got to have it tonight. They came out. They got it despite all odds. Nobody believed in them. We believed in them. Well, I didn't technically believe them because I picked the Titans. No. But we all know why I picked the Titans. Because I <laughs> wanted this outcome, baby. Yeah. Hey, I'm glad I made that pick for you. It felt good relaying your pick. <laughs> And it made me more confident in my pick. And then the Vegas line move in favor of the Colts. Everybody today, WFAN today, Evan Roberts, well, he was giving his, uh, they do promos for the different gambling sites, and he was doing one for FanDuel. And he was like, and gamble on FanDuel, blah, blah, blah. Hey, you could get the Titans plus a point tonight. So you could get that. He was like, that's the easiest bet of the week. The Titans, why are they underdogs at home? What have the Colts done to be favorites? Well, 34-17. Let's get into the defense now, Jason. Sluggish start to start off. Kickoff return. Nice kickoff return. Fake kickoff return for the Titans. They score that first drive. A couple of really big plays right down the field. Xavier Rhodes took a shot to the head. I didn't think he was going to play for the rest of the game. I thought he was going to have a concussion. And it's so weird how that works with concussion. Sometimes it looks like absolutely nothing. A guy's out for four weeks. And then sometimes it looks like a guy's dead on the field. And then they're back the next series. So thank God that Xavier was able to get up from that. He was able to jog off and then he was able to come back in the game. The Colts defense gave up all 17 points in the first half. We trailed 17, 10 rattled off 24 unanswered and the defense second half adjustments, just like Cleveland a couple of times this year, just great. I think the Browns game, this game, a couple games where we pitched shutouts in the second half, and then a couple games where we probably could have if we want. I think the Jets also maybe another shutout in the second half. So I think we've had four shutouts in the second half. The Bears easily could have been one. The Vikings easily could have been one. Just a great job from the Colts defense. And we pretty much highlight the same players every week. But a guy I have to give a shout-out to today, Jason, who played his ass off, Kari Willis. I thought Kari Willis was fantastic. Stewart, again, Grover Stewart's turning into a Pro Bowl player. I mean, at this point, at this rate, I think he has to make the Pro Bowl. I think we should have two Pro Bowl defensive tackles this year. Even though he doesn't get the notoriety he deserves, he's been playing great football. And it was just a great team effort from this defense. I thought Rock was shaky. I thought he got off to a slow start, even though he played better in the second half. Rhodes coming back was huge 
for this defense. Julian Blackman came up and made one of the best plays. He's starting to turn into Sanders in his ability to make plays at every level because the first couple weeks, all his plays seemed to be more in the middle of the field and deep, and now he's starting to come up and get tackles for loss and make plays behind the line of scrimmage. He had a great one last week with Kenny Moore setting the edge, and then today another great play. So this Colts defense every week, and you just hear new names pop up every week. They're just so deep, so talented. Autry with a big sack. It was just a really solid performance from this Colts defense with those second half adjustments coming out and playing better football as the game goes on, which is something teams have struggled with against the Titans because they are so physical with Derrick Henry and their ground and pound game. Usually it gets tougher for defenses as the game goes on against them, but the Colts defense got stronger as the game went on, which is something I don't think Tennessee is used to. When you look at all their games, even the game against Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh has a damn good defense. They came back in that game and they started to wear them down where if you add five minutes to the end of the fourth quarter, I think they end up beating Pittsburgh. And they have a lot of games this year where they came from behind because they just wear you down, wear you down, wear you down. It was the opposite today. It was almost like we wore them down as our defense got stronger and stronger and stronger as the game went on. Yeah, I want to give the Titans some credit. I mean, they came out and and they came out throwing, and they went down the field throwing the ball. It was obvious that we were going to come out to stop Henry, and so they came out and switched it up. And you got to give them credit. They came out with a good game plan to do something different than what we expected. So it took us a little bit of time to get adjusted to that. But once we got adjusted to that, and granted, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a, a little bit of a rant here, Luke, on some of our local media, specifically Kevin Bowen. I don't know if Kevin realizes that Derrick Henry is like the best running back in the league, but for the entire week and during this entire game, all he did was tweet negative stuff about our defense. He tweeted, well, you've given up 34 points in the last hat, like in the last full game. You gave up 17 to start the the end, the Ravens and 17 to start the Titans. Hey, hey, Hey buddy, we're playing against really good teams. At the end of the day, Derrick Henry is a very good football player. Lamar Jackson is a very good football player. Nobody's been able to stop these guys. There's a reason for it. Lamar Jackson won MVP last year. Derrick Henry leads the league in rushing or is second in the league in rushing this year. So these aren't just, you know, pop Warner players we're playing against. People have to get adjusted. So my thing is this. Derrick Henry, yes, he has had 200-yard games against the Colts, which Kevin Bowen pointed out 450 times today. (laughs) But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter. What matters is wins. Flus has played the Titans five games. Do you know how many games that Flus has lost against the Titans? One. And that game wasn't decided by Derrick Henry, mind you. That was decided by our field goal team getting a game-tying field goal blocked and returned for a touchdown. So I'm tired of like looking at Kevin Bowen's negative tweets about our defense. You know how many points our defense gave up in the second half, Luke? I'm going to go zero. Zero points, Luke. <laughs> Do you think he even tweeted that? No. I'm going to say no. Of course not. Also, Jason, if you go back to that Ravens game, yeah, we give up, what, 17 points in the second half? But yep. at least 10 of the points for the game were on our offense. So the defense gave up two touchdown drives, and one of them was off a turnover to Lamar Jackson. That's going to happen when you play an MVP caliber player, even though I know Lamar hasn't been as good this year as he was last year. But we give up 24 points last week. Seven of them was on the scoop and score. And then three of them came on a field goal where the Ravens took over on downs and they went three plays, three and out, and kicked the field goal in the same spot we turned the ball over on downs. So how could the defense be blamed for that? Were they supposed to move them back 10 yards or cause a turnover. They did their job. They got off the field in three plays. Unfortunately, the Ravens took over in a position where they were already in field goal range with probably the best kicker in football in Tucker. I don't understand what it is about our media with Flus. They have seemed to not like him from the beginning. I don't know if it's the the scheme or whatever it is, but it's almost like they didn't watch Chuck Pagano for six years. You know know what I mean? And Jason – The Fox team said it today. The Colts defense was third to worst in the National Football League as an overall team defense the year before Flus took over. In 2017, we had the 29th. 
defense in the yep. National Football League, our 30th defense in the National Football League. Coming into tonight, you know what the overall defense was? First in the National Football League. And top five all- in like 30 different categories. Yet, for and some reason, Flus keeps defense. getting criticized. It doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. And they don't. And the thing is, they, if you're going to be critical of uh, uh, and nitpick a guy, then nitpick the whole team, but he doesn't do that. And I just don't get it. It's like these guys, it's like back with the Peyton Manning thing. It was always, well, Peyton only won one Super Bowl here. He didn't win enough. He didn't win enough Super Bowls. It's like, what is wrong with these people? Then Pagano gets here, and it's like he gets a six-year cruise, a six-year, yeah. you know, pass to paradise. It's unbelievable. Then, and then Eberflus comes in after our defense was a burning trash can under Pagano, and in the first year, we're 11th. You know, last year we Dude, it doesn't make back, any sense of- to me. It makes no sense. Kravitz killed Manning year after year after year after year. The last thing I want to say about about Kevin Bowen and and all the all these people that are seemingly watching a different defense than I am because I'm watching one that is just absolutely dominating at some point. They're not dominating all the time because those other guys get paid too. But they're one of the top three defenses in this league, and they're legit. And if you didn't, if you can't see that, you don't know football, period. And guess what? When he's gone next year, and he's going to be gone, coaching probably in Houston, you're going to miss him because whoever comes in here ain't going to be as good. So I just want to make that point. We can get back into the game. But I, I saw Kevin Bowen you know, with his little shots fired throughout the game. And I want people to know, Flus is the real deal, man. This guy's going to get a head coaching job inside NFL circles. Everyone knows this guy is as good as it comes when it comes to teaching football, teaching the game, knowing the game, and nobody works harder than him. So, and everyone that knows this show knows I love Flus. I've been, I've been, I've been riding with him since two, and Luke too. Both yeah. of us have been riding with him since 2018. This is the best DC we've had in decades. So. I'm always going to have his back when I see media criticizing the best part of our team. I am going to say something. I said something to him on Twitter. I'm saying something on our show. Let it be known. I think he's going to be a head coach next year. I just pray it's not our division. But Flutes did another great job tonight adjusting and giving up. What was it, Luke, in the second half? I think it was zero points. Zero points. All right, let's move on. (laughs) And I like Kevin Bowen a lot. I've had him on, we've had him on the show at least five to seven times. And every time I've asked him, he's always been nice enough to come on. So I like him a lot. I usually trust what he says. If he's at training camp or not at training camp, that's when I like to have him on to come on and tell us what he sees. Cause I usually trust his opinion, but the floose takes are out of control. And then we're making it like Derrick Henry, some average C minus running back. Derrick Henry led the league in rushing last year. He's second in the league in rushing this year. He had, when they put that chart up, he's had over 100 in, I think, six out of the eight games, and he went over 200 one game. So he's a great running back. I don't understand why we're making it, or our media is making it like he's just some average Joe. Derrick Henry is a great running back. He is the heartbeat of that team. He basically single-handedly carried them to the AFC Championship last year. I think he's also a big reason why Ryan Tannehill got the contract he got. And no disrespect to Tannehill, who's playing much better football than he ever played in Miami. But if Henry's not as good as he was last year, especially in the playoffs, and they don't go where they go, and they don't win all those games they win last year after making the move at quarterback and benching Mariota, Tannehill probably doesn't get paid. Because as good as Tannehill was, he was – for the most part, managing an offense carried by the running back and superb right. defense by the Titans down the stretch last year as well. Now, the defense is obviously taking a step back this year, but as good as Ryan Tannehill has been, and he's been you know, a breath of fresh air after having Mariota, but Derrick Henry has carried that offense. So I don't understand why people would look at Henry running for 100 yards and view it as a negative thing. He's a great player. Yeah. He could run for 100 against any defense. Absolutely. And just to, just to get back to the game, I really thought our front four was outstanding. I thought Grover Stewart played with so much tenacity tonight. I mean, his motor was unbelievable. I know he ran, there was a play where he ran Henry down from behind and got him uh, right before he got to a first. I just love the way 
I love the way our players are coached to play hard all the time, and they always fly around and play fast. You see it every week. I'm seeing fans from even the Patriots saying they love watching our defense play because they fly around. They hit anything that moves. I mean, they're just so fun to watch. And I thought Willis was outstanding tonight. I thought Blackman on the back end did a good job of not letting anything get over the top. I thought the two linebackers in nickel, uh, Leonard and Okariki, were outstanding. Carey was outstanding. Really the only guys I had a real issue with, Xavier Rhodes and Rock was bad pretty much throughout the entire game. But Xavier Rhodes, I think, was nicked up, man. I, I He had a, you know he had that, that brutal hit. I know they wouldn't let him back out there if he wasn't, if he didn't pass the protocol or whatever. But he just, he just struggled a little bit in this game. And for good reason. I mean, A.J. Brown's a hell of a player. Jonu Smith is a big-time tight end for them that I like a lot. He had a big game. But all in all, man, most of our guys came out, and they just did their thing. They played well. They, they, they played the defense. They played their techniques. They played what they were coached, and that's what, you, that's what you get from players that are coached by great coaches, and that's what we have on defense, a great coach. Outstanding job shutting them down in the second half, not letting them breathe. I mean, just you know, making the tackles, doing everything they need to do to put our offense back on the field and to, to kind of wear them down, which in the end is what we did, I thought. So – Kudos to the defense. Uh, I thought they put a lot of pressure on Tannehill. It doesn't show up in the sack department. But, again, I'm not really the, a, a huge proponent of, of sacks as much as I am of constant pressure. And he was on his back a lot in this game. He got hit by Buckner. He got hit by Grover, Autry, Houston. all those guys. Houston, all the, yeah, all those guys were in his face all game. All clean legal hits, I think, except for one. And, uh, and, and so – uh, just a great job by, by our front four again, man, because honestly, Flus didn't blitz much tonight. It was on the front four to beat those guys, and I thought for the most part they did a great job. And, and as far as Derrick Henry goes, yeah, he got his yards. He got 100 yards. But you know how many touchdowns he got? Zero. And that's really the bottom line, keeping him out of the end zone. Colts kept him out of the end zone. Great job. Great win. Great team win. And, uh, you know, the defense, the offense, both did their jobs, and so did the special teams. we got to talk about the special teams a little bit too, Luke. Yep, and that was the biggest difference because the defense I thought was solid. They were great in the second half, but they gave up 17 in the first half. The offense, they struggled to start the game. Then they had one of their better games of the season. But special teams, besides the opening kickoff, was all Colts. Like, they made their plays offensively. They made their plays defensively. On special teams, it was 100%, or I would say 95% Colts, 5% Titans. They had the shank punt, which gave the Colts a short field to go in and take the lead for the first time, 2017. They had the punt get blocked for a touchdown, or I should say we blocked the punt for the touchdown. EJ Speed, friend of the show, got the punt blocked. TJ Carey returned it for a touchdown. TJ Carey's second touchdown of the year, had a pick six against Darnold, now has the scoop and score off the block punt. So TJ Carey finding the end zone twice. Imagine that as a prop bet, Jason. TJ Carey scoring two touchdowns before T.Y. Hilton scoring one touchdown. I don't think you could put – if you put $1 on that in August, you would have won probably – a quarter million dollars. And then we had Rodrigo Blankenship make all his field goals, make all his extra points, and they missed a field goal. So it was all Colts on special teams, and that's one-third of the game. So you don't talk much about special teams, but then it could win you or lose you a game, and the Colts do go on to win this game by 17, but sometimes a little bit of momentum here or there, if you get off a really good punt, and this is something I think people don't really realize. Like I was saying this about the Marcus Peters interception last week. Yeah, they do go on to beat us by 14 points last week. But one play could swing a game and it could be more than just one play or seven points or three points. It could change the entire outlook of the game and getting the ball back, let's say on our own 30 yard line, maybe we go three and out. Maybe we just don't have the momentum like we got off that shanked punt. And it just changes everything. So special teams are such a big part of the game. Even though people don't talk about them, when you see a game like this where there are so many plays that clearly favored one team, it could be the difference in a game. And I think it was one of the big reasons why the Colts win this game comfortably at the end. 100% agree. As usual, man, our our special teams dominated. That's all you can say. Other than the initial kickoff, that little 
gadget reverse kind of fake reverse they ran. Other than that, man, we just dominated on special teams. I mean, Blankenship made everything. Speed almost got an initial block, but I think our 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 special teams pressure got to that punter to speed him up and make him shank that ball. So that was a huge play, and then we immediately scored a touchdown. But to me, the biggest play of the game was speed blocking that that punt and carry returning it for a touchdown because they were getting the ball back down three. It was still a really close game. That opened it up to a double-digit game. It probably changed the way they ran their offense, and that entail led into – you know, right into a plate, right into our hands because Flus, you know, when you give Flus a 10 point lead, he's going to do, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty much done. So I thought the, the special teams were, were like they were most of this year, outstanding. It reminded me of the Chicago game when the, when I feel like our special teams were so dominant. I mean, they just, they made everything, made all their field goals, had a block punt. I mean, just, just changed the momentum of the game. So, I mean, for me, it was just a full team win. I feel so great about it. I mean, there's really nothing that bad that came out of this game other than Penny Moore with a rib injury. Hopefully the extra four days will allow him to heal because he's a big part of what we do on defense. You know, Terry filled in ad- admirably for him because I think Kenny Moore was out for, I think, most of the fourth quarter. So he did a good job when he came in for him, but there's no replacing Kenny Moore. He's one of the more important guys on our defense. So hopefully this time off, you know, it's funny now, playing this game on Thursday is kind of good because now we've got that extra time to heal for our next game. So hopefully that extra time will allow him to heal and it's not too much of a serious injury and we'll get him back for the Green Bay game because we're going to need Hall hands on deck to slow down Rodgers and that offense. But as far as this game goes, man, all three phases, outstanding job, great job by the coaching staff, just a huge win, a season-changing win. The division is ours if we can just – if we, if we can beat them the next time we see them, I think we win the division. So the ne- You know, it's the biggest game till the next time we see them. Mm-hmm. But to, for tonight, man, I'm going to sleep well. Outstanding job by the Colts. I'm proud of everybody, man. Just an absolutely huge win by the Indianapolis Colts. Yep, and one more thing I want to say before we get to the players of the game. I thought the execution right before the half was fantastic. Rivers takes a sack, and everybody on the offense knew exactly what to do. They're able to get to the line. They're able to spike the ball. I mean, of course, you don't want to get sacked there. It would be great if you score a touchdown there. But I thought the management and the mental whereabouts to get back up, get to the line, get the ball spiked, spike it with one second, and then hit the field goal before the half, I thought that was fantastic execution because those three points at the time were huge. I just wanted points there. We're getting ball second half. Just put up three, and we get ball second half. And then we had a good drive to open the second half. Obviously, we turned the ball over on downs inside the one-yard line. But I like the aggression. We had multiple fourth down opportunities. We were two for two on fourth down. And then we had the unfortunate turnover on downs inside the one-yard line after putting up seven points. And that's demoralizing. To see seven points or six points go up on the board and then to get it reversed off the review. Now, they got that right. Pascal was definitely down inside the one-yard line. But to see those points come off the board and then to get stuffed on third down and to get stuffed on fourth down and to turn the ball over on downs, that's demoralizing. The Titans offense comes out. They pick up a first down right away. And you're thinking, oh, my God, we were about to be up by three points. We're down by four points. And they just got the ball out of the danger zone being trapped inside the two-yard line. But then we're able to get that shank punt because we put pressure on the punter. And the rest is history. So just a great job facing adversity, going on the road, Thursday night football, an incredible job by this team, all three phases, like we said. And now, Jason, it is time for our For the Culture player of the game well i'm going to go with friend of the show and young linebacker ej speed just an outstanding job on special teams i would pick the whole special teams if i could but i'm going to pick one guy because i thought his one play really two plays where he pressured the punter the first time and forced him into a i i I don't know if he specifically forced him into the shank but the pressure absolutely forced the punter into his shank that, that really helped our offense get down the field to score. But then the play of the game for me, EJ Speed blocking the punt, TJ Carey picking it up and scoring, scoop and score, went from a three-point, them, them getting the ball down three to them getting the ball back down ten. I think that changed the game. I think that changed their offensive outlook. 
I think that was really the, the momentum play that changed the game to the Colts and for the Colts for good. And we just, and we just rolled, we just kind of coasted the victory after that. So an absolutely outstanding job by EJ speed on special teams. He's been good all year and he was outstanding tonight, made a big time play in a big time game on a big time stage. So shout out to EJ speed front of the show. Great job tonight, brother. Great pick, Jason. I thought you were going to pick Naheem Hines. I thought that was the obvious pick, but I'm glad you went with EJ Speed so I could go with Naheem Hines, who was a spark for us offensively. It was his third game this season with multiple touchdowns. He has zero touchdowns in the rest of the games combined. So when we get him going, we get him going, and then it just seems like we abandon him the next week. So against Green Bay, I would like to see my player of the game and the birthday boy, Naheem Hines, stay involved in the offense. But he was fantastic in the air and on the ground. 12 carries, 70 yards, a touchdown, and then receiving, he had five receptions for 45 yards and a touchdown. So he was up over 110 yards of total offense from the line of scrimmage, a pair of touchdowns, and just electrifying when he gets the ball, when he gets the ball in space, bouncing outside. He was fantastic today. EJ Speed was fantastic too. Our For the Culture players of the game, you have EJ Speed and you have Naheem Hines. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of guys we could have chose from, Luke. And, and one other guy I'd kind of like to give a special shout-out to is Michael Pittman Jr. had his first 100-yard game, which is really, really special. He would, I mean, we could have easily picked him. I just... The reason why I think we went with the guys we went with is they, they were big impact guys on the game early and, and, and then peed later in the game. So, But I don't want anybody to think we forgot about Pitt. He had a great game, really just an outstanding job. And, and just my final thoughts on the win and looking forward, the Colts had to have this game. I said it before the game. I wanted the division, and I, I thought the only way to the winning the division was winning both games against the Titans. I still believe that. We got the one on the road. We'll see him again in 17 days. I like our matchup with them. I think we match up well. They can't really contain our passing game. So I don't feel like a lot. I don't think we should change a lot going forward into the next game. Obviously, you're going to scheme a few things differently. You know, maybe the beginning of the game when you're, you know, trying to, you know, do the square peg round hole thing with the running game. Maybe you throw all some of those plays out and you get more in space outside the tackle runs, uh, more slants and stuff like that with the uh, with the running backs. But as a whole, I really like our matchup with this team, and I feel like tonight was a huge win for the for the momentum of the squad and also just the confidence after a tough game against a really good Baltimore team to go on the road four days later and, and just come out and find a way, man. Things didn't start well, but they sure as hell finished well. And uh, really proud of the guys. I'm proud of the players. I'm proud of the team. Excited about seeing them against Green Bay. I think that's going to be a great matchup for our defense. It'll be fun to see how Fluce schemes up our D for for, uh, for Aaron Rodgers because we all know Aaron Rodgers is one of the best in the game. So that's going to be fun to watch. But we got a nice, long 10-day break. Get some guys healthy, come back, be ready to play, and uh, finish this season strong, man. We've got, what, seven games left. And uh, I think the only really, really tough defense that we play going, out, going forward is the Steelers' defense. Other than that, the, the defenses that we're playing, we should be able to have some offensive success against. There's divisions in front of us. It's ours if we want it. If we can go get that second win against the Titans, then we can win this division, and that's what I wanted from day one. And a lot of people thought we were crazy by saying that, but I really because because the Titans went to the AFC Championship last year. But I really believe that with Rivers and and this defense, this team could win the division. And now you're seeing it kind of come to fruition. Now the Colts just have to take that next step and keep playing well, keep getting better, and knock on wood, stay healthy. And we'll be all right the rest of the year. Yep. And we should be the favorites at this point. We're tied in the standings, six and three, six and three. We won that first head to head, and we look like the better team. We should be heavy favorites when we see them in a few weeks. They go to Baltimore this week. That's going to be a tough game. I think we will see them. The next time we see them, I think we will see them come to Indianapolis at six and four. We don't have a guarantee, of course, against Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers, but I don't think they are going to beat. Baltimore. So I think we're going to see them coming off back-to-back -back losses and not just back-to-back -back losses, but four out of their last five because they right now are one and three over their last four. This is a team that started off five and up. They lost back-to-back -back games. They lost the game to the Bengals. Then they won last week against the Bears and they lost to us today. 
So Steelers, Bengals, they beat the Bears, and then they lost to us today. So they've lost three out of four, and I think they're going to lose next week, so that'll be four out of five. And then we'll see them again. It's going to be kind of the opposite, the next, hopefully kind of the opposite of this game, next game. Because if we can take care of business against Green Bay, and that's not, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if we do and they lose to the Ravens, we go into that game seven and three. They go into that game six and four. We go into that game seven and three, and we win that game. Then they're six and five, and we're eight and three with two wins over them. We're ahead by two and a half games. Yeah, I actually so, think that'll be a bigger game for them than today was for us, because today for us, even though we had that Jacksonville loss and they were already two and zero in the division, we did still play them again. Where if they lose to Jacksonville or they lose to Houston and we sweep the rest of our division, which would have been a lot to ask for because we would have needed to go 4-0 after this. They would have had to have lost to us and then lost one out of two to two bad teams in the Texans and Jags. But because we still had them, I think that that game would be a bigger game for them than this game today was for us. But it would have been very similar because we came into today a game back and then they'd be going into that game a game back. But obviously a lot of football left to be played before that. We still have to play a good Packer team. They still have to play a good Ravens team. So it should be interesting. And both teams will obviously have 10 days to prepare, get ready, and get healthy for the Ravens and Packers respectively. But this is a Titans team that started off at 5-0. and They could easily be sitting at 6-4 and coming to Indianapolis in a few weeks and then leaving Indianapolis, hopefully at six and five, which would be crazy for a team that started off five and zero. Oh. but obviously we are getting way ahead of ourselves. It's Packers, Packers, Packers going into next week, but also enjoy your Sunday where we are going to go into these one o'clock kickoffs with a not only with a win already on the week but already a titans loss so we got the best of both worlds already and it's only thursday night early friday morning so we're going to go into sunday with the ability to exhale relax chill out watch some football enjoy ourselves you don't even really need to worry about the texans or the jags because they both look out of it at this point so it's going to be a super chill day on Sunday with our focus on the division and the only team that we're really going up against mano y mano is going to be off like we will with a loss. So a very good time to be a Colt fan, a very good night and a very good week to be a Colt fan. This was probably the biggest regular season game since week 17 when we went to Tennessee and beat the Titans in 2018. Here we are two quarterbacks and two seasons later And we find a way to go on the road and beat the Tennessee Titans. So, Jason, great win. Great win. I think all Colt fans should be happy with this win, happy with the way Frank Reich was able to respond and the players were able to respond and Rivers was able to respond. The defense in the second half, pitching the shutout, special teams, fantastic today. A real lopsided difference between the two special teams, Colts and Titans. 34-17. Aaron Rodgers and the Packers next week. That should be a fun one at Lucas Oil Stadium. And then the following week, Colts, Titans, part two. So I'm very, very excited. That's my man, Jason Spears. I'm your host, Luke Diamond. And this is the For the Culture Podcast.